If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 23, and we're going to begin reading there in the first verse, and uh, while, while you're turning there, uh, as always, I ask for your prayers as I try to preach the word, I want to be in the Lord's will first of all, and uh, he, then if I'm there, he'll take care of the rest. Uh, Genesis chapter 23, uh, beginning, beginning in the very first verse. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the days of the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kithjah Araba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn Sarah and to weep for her. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we pray uh, that this morning that we would be uh, granted uh, to see the meaningfulness of life, Lord, and for the preciousness of it and the short character that life has for us here on this earth and the eternal value in the world to come. We praise you for that. God, help us this morning that you'd hide us behind yourself. And Lord, that you would proclaim the word that you've given uh, for this people today, Lord. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Maybe some not so familiar verses. Uh, a lot of times what I preach comes from what um, people have read and reread. Uh, and you may have looked into the death of Sarah, but most of the time the people do. They just keep running, and uh, Sarah's kind of forgotten in the, in, in the um, light of other things that are fixing to happen. Uh, but what I've found is every life is important. Every life is noteworthy. Every life, if you believe this Bible as you should, every life has a purpose. And the purpose of that life is always accomplished. You know, some people will say, just say for the town drunk and he's gone. Well, his life was wasted. No ma'am, no sir, there's no one life that's wasted. If nothing else, that individual died with a testimony that he was more in bondage to alcohol than anything else. It might serve as warning for people who want to try that mess, right. his life was not in vain. Right. And we live in a day and age today where I think we're almost convinced that life is unimportant, that it's here today and you're gone and, and, and that's it. But we see some notes about the life of Sarah and particularly about her death that I think is noteworthy. First of all, the, the very first verse uh, says this, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. Now that is a good long life. In some people's scientific uh, realm today, they'd say, well, that's impossible. Well, even in recent history, before uh, very much more recent than Bible times, and you can Google it tonight when you have all that extra time, uh, in not, and I think uh, the young, the lady that I'm thinking of, she was a French woman, lived from 1820 to two, uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, 1870 to uh, 1994. She lived 124 years in very recent history. But you know what happened to that woman in France? She died. You can imagine the things that she had literally seen both world wars. People going from horse and buggy uh, and, until um, uh, uh, motor cars of every kind. And uh, that's a good long life, but she died. So when we first look at the life of Sarah uh, and the life of any individual, remember it's a real life. It, it, it is a testimony. Things happen between the dates on the gravestone, and that was the life of Sarah. Uh, uh, the woman I'm talking about, uh, I think,
time she was born, uh, or even from today, we'll just say from today back 127 years would have been the year 1893, uh, 24 years, I mean 20 years before the A model Ford came out and changed the, uh, the auto uh, industry, 22 years before uh, uh, England declared war on Germany the first time, 22 years before that occurred. Um, Grover Cleveland was our president, and here locally there was a railroad that went from Bear Springs to Tennessee Ridge that most people don't even know about. Uh, that's 127 years, but then she died. See, uh, in, in, the, in addition to longevity, death is coming. Death is a reality that every one of us must face at some point or the other. And I dare say this, most people think about it way too late. And I'll even go further, some people never consider it at all. Uh, they never really looked at death is coming. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the days of the life of Sarah. Now, another thing I want you to look at is the meaning of Sarah. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't really esteem in the modern day uh, what names mean. But it was very, very important to the Jewish people that they name those people appropriate. Even here in our country, a lot of times names weren't given to babies during the, until the first year of life. They, they didn't call them anything. I've seen death certificates of baby at 13 months old that still didn't even have a name. And you know what? They were looking for what fit. They were looking at something that described this child that made him or her different, and they assigned that name to that individual. And so we find what does Sarah mean? Uh, Sarah means princess. Now, uh, that, is, uh, that is the meaning a ruler, a young ruler, a female ruler. So we have two princesses in our midst this morning, and you didn't even know it. And, and so Sarah, that, that is what it meant. So it was the dying of a princess. It was a, a, the dying of a royalty. And she was the mother, you know, everybody says, well, Abraham was the father of Israel, and that's very true, but Abraham, but Sarah was the mother of Israel. She had a testimony behind her. She got the, you know what, it, it, it's a miraculous thing to see a child born, yeah. but I'll tell you what, at 90, <laughs> it's more than a miracle. It's unbelievable. And, and listen, again, I'm getting back to this point. That was 90 years just like we know them. That was 127 years of the life of Sarah just like we know them. And, and so we find then that she indeed had a very miraculous life to give birth. And, you know, you can imagine and everybody gets real nervous when they're in their 40s. Uh, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want any more children. I'm afraid I won't be able to see them grown. But well, can you imagine having one at 90? And it was a promise. This will be your son. It was a promise. Now, do you believe in the promises of God? See, I do. A lot of people don't today, but I, I still believe every promise that he made. And listen, I'm not going to spiritualize a one of them. If the Bible says that I believe it, it's a promise, you know what? I believe he's coming back. Right. Uh, that's a promise. And, and, and so we find then that Sarah had a very unique, special life and accomplished a very special purpose with her life, but she did die. She did give up the ghost. And Sarah died in Kirth J. Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, I also want you to see that uh, Sarah died in a pagan land. Now, Israel did not yet 
exist, that would be a little bit, well, really, if you want to say, it'd be 500 years down the road. But she died in a strange land. Have you ever thought about that? It's a pretty strange day that we live, is it not? Men marrying men and women marrying women. That's strange. People can accept it for what they want to, but you know what? When the water's boiled off, that's just odd. That's just strange. We live in a strange day. We live in a day of gender reassignment. Uh, you, can have, you can have yourself change around and be a woman if you're a man, be a, a man if you're a woman. But you know what? This is the thing with all those advancements. Do you know, and this is the purpose for uh, one of the purposes of women, them, them fellas that get all that done, they still can't birth children. I don't think they're a woman, do you? They get off all that medicine. You know what? They, they, they grow a beard, beard as thick as mine. Because you know what? It's not who they are. It's not who they are. And, and, and so we find then that being in that strange land, she died there. You know what? If the Lord doesn't come, you're going to die in this strange land that we live in. You're still going to be a pilgrim. You're still not going to feel at home. And, and so we find the next thing with Sarah's wife, she died in a strange land. And then we get to the end of that verse. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah, which was very important, uh, very appropriate. They had probably been married greater than 80 years. And so it was very appropriate that he come, and maybe even more like 90. And, and, and very, very appropriate that he come and give his wife due benevolence and, and mourn her passing. It said he came to weep and to mourn. Now, you know what? We live in a day and age today where people go to the funeral home, but I don't see, I don't see weeping like I used to, do you? I remember the first funeral I remember going to is my grandfather's funeral. And uh, Mama and her brother were really, really tore up. They were more. Now, that's been 41 years ago now. And times have changed things. And it's not. And you know what? I think that is. And I've wondered and wondered. Number one, I don't think we love like they once did. And the other thing, and I know this to be true, we don't value life like we once did. If you can give someone a lethal injection, you don't value life. You know what I think about lethal injections? They're no different than putting a gun to someone's head and blowing their head off. No difference whatsoever. You end someone's life. And so I think one reason that we don't weep and mourn very much like Abraham does is that we don't pay, place any real value on life anymore. Here today, gone tomorrow, so what? Well, let me tell you this. There's a big so what on the other side of death, and that's the judgment. There's a big so what after the end of this. Verse 3, and Abraham stood up before his dead. Now, I want you to see that Abraham mourned appropriately and then it was time to move on. <clears throat> you ever seen anybody crippled by grief? They're never ever the same. I have. And I'm not saying that I, that I understand it, but I know my God is able. He can move you forward. In other words, Abraham was very appropriate, but he knew death was a reality. He knew that death was part of life, and he got back up. You know what? I've seen a lot of individuals in my life that never really got back up. Yeah. That Not only did death destroy their loved one, it destroyed them too. And some people say, well, how can you just keep going? Well, when Judy died, you know how I kept going? In the presence of the Lord. Yes, it was devastating. We were like one and two. We were, we, besides Donna, we were best friends for 44 
years, but I had to keep going. See, don't let anybody's death cripple you. Because you know what? This is the reality. You got one coming too. Value life, give it everything that you got. And then, and then uh, when death comes, maybe, maybe you won't have no regrets. And so we find that Abraham gets himself up. Abraham stood up from before the dead and spake to the sons of Heth, which was the ruler in that area, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner. Now, can you say that this morning? I am a stranger and a traveler. First of all, if you look out on the company uh, outside this building today, a lot of the Lord's people, they're not strange. They fit just like right in, like twos between one and three. They're just part of the scheme. The scheme. They don't look different. They're not strange. They're just like the world. They blend right in, and nobody knows them from one from the other. You know what? They give up their testimony, and they give up their identity as a believer. And why? So they'll smooth right in. You know what? And, and I've been there, and a young person in the public, all they want is to fit in. And that's homeschoolers and, 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 and public schoolers, and, and that's just a push of the teenage years. And if you don't believe that, remember yourself. Didn't you want to fit in? Didn't you want to be like everybody else? You wanted to dress like everybody else? You wanted to have your hair like everybody else? You just wanted to be like everybody else, right? You didn't want to stick out. But Abraham did not care. He said, hey, I am what I am. I'm a soldier. I know what I am. I'm strange to you. I'm different than you. And hey, this is the difference with Abraham. I'm okay with that. I know I'm different, I know I'm strange, and I'm good with that. Can you say that this morning? That you're both a stranger, and you're okay with it. You know what, uh, uh, and it, it took me the 50, 50 at least, or 45 maybe, of the 51 years I've lived to come to that point, that hey, I'm not going to fit in, first of all, and the harder one is it's okay. I, I, I'm cool with that. That, that. That's fine with me. I'm a, I'm a stranger. And the next thing he says about himself is I'm a sojourner. I'm a stranger and I'm a sojourner. Now, the sojourner part is a little bit different because what a sojourner does is he's always looking for home. A sojourner never puts down roots. A sojourner never... Uh, never really uh, adapts to the culture. They're always looking. You see what? What he was looking for was an abode with God, a living with God, a nurturing relationship with God, and he kept moving, and he kept moving, and he kept moving. Now, me and Donna's lived out there in our place 22 years, we'll be in May, and that's home to me, but I ought to be a sojourner. You see what I'm saying? My in-laws, uh, they lived in the house they live in now for 51 years. And the reason I know is my wife will be 51 in April. Uh, that's a long time. You know, the best I can tell you, that's not your time. Uh, be a sojourner. Uh, just know that you're traveling day. You know what the very best thing you can say once you're dead is my traveling days are over. I'm done. And, and so we find then that these two testimonies <coughs> was of Abraham. And because of they were of Abraham, now she was dead. But before she was dead, they had to be true of Sarah too. She was a sojourner and a stranger in an even stranger land. I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now, I think that that, that, that second part 
uh, bury our dead out of my sight is a very, a very strange way to say that. And I really want to believe what he meant, it's time to move on. See, if he constantly had Sarah right there with him and, and thinking about Sarah and, and mourning and grieving over Sarah, he would have never, you know what he'd done? He'd give up his, his, his title as sojourner. He'd give up his position as a, move, a person that kept moving on, looking for God. He'd give that up. So as cruel as this sounds, I don't want her in my sight. I want to bury her. Now, on a, a different note of that, he desired to bury her. He didn't desire to have her cremated. He wanted her buried. Now, y'all don't have to go to a lot of expense when I die, but put me in a pine box right out here, and you bury what's left. That's one thing I've emphasized to my two sons. I said, I don't care if you have to dig it yourself, and it's ugly when you're done, just get me in the ground. It, it, it's a biblical principle. That's right. You know, uh, the Bible says this, that God buried Moses. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good standard. Right. Uh, if God did it, it must be right. And, and, and so we find then that he was ready to move on, he was ready to, to, to give his wife her due benevolence, but he wasn't crippled by what happened. Verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, and I want you to notice it's a little L, just recognizing that Abraham was a, a uh, important person or a person that ruled Hear us, my Lord, thou art my, a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Now, in that region, in that place, ground is, ground is hard as the concrete floor down in that basement. So burying the way that we bury in the soft, the relatively soft soil of Tennessee, it wasn't an option because it was so hard. So all they did, including the Lord Jesus Christ, they hollowed out in the stone in the sides of mountains, sepulchers. It, it, it's what we would call a mausoleum. Um, an above the ground, but stone-sealed place to bury the dead. And, and his question, his invitation, and it was all of them, would just be buried with us. You know what that was? That was an invitation to acclimate to the world. Hey, we got graves all over this hillside. Just stick her in one of those. We want you to. But see, if Abraham had taken Sarah's body and stuck it in one of theirs, you know what he'd been doing? He'd been acclimating to the world. He would have saying, you know what? What you're doing is just as good as I'm doing. And he would give up his position as a sojourner. He would have acclimated to the world. And he was like, no, no. Can't do that one. He's faithful what he's been called to do. And, and, and so we find that they didn't quite get that. They didn't quite understand why this was important to Abraham. Verse 6, I mean, verse 7, and Abraham stood up. You know what? Somebody stands up, it's for recognition. Now, I am not a fighter in the least. I will try to avoid confrontation, but uh, I don't like to see people insulted. And years ago, there was an Egyptian doctor that practiced down in uh, Clarksville, and we had a number of his patients. And you'd have to know this girl to know what I'm saying. She's hard as flint. And we know the van saying. And she was on the phone with this doctor, and I saw her crying, and she just put the phone down. And uh, man, I didn't know. I thought, I thought, well, probably one of our patients has died. And I said, no, no, what's wrong? She said, well, that doctor's cussed me out. And uh, called me everything but a doctor. I don't know what his name, and I ain't going to say his name, 
But I pick up that phone. This is what I told him. He said, I, I said, listen, I don't know where you're from or how you treat women from where you're from, but I said, if you're going to treat my nurses like this, get back on the boat and catch the next one home. And so that was all of it for a while. And then several years later, we had this marketer, market our, our home health, and she goes, Larry, I really wish you'd come and see this doctor and let him know we'd be proud of his business. And I said, I, I said, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, he won't remember that. Uh, just, just come on, come on. Well, you're the marketer. So the doctor came in and she was introducing everybody in the room. And she, and, uh, she got to me and said, this is Larry Lafferty. And he stood up and said, you're Larry Lafferty? And I stood up and I said, yeah, I'm Larry Lafferty. <laughs> and that's kind of what was going home with Abraham. He saw the significance of the problem. Now, he wasn't being disrespectful, which is why I have to say probably I was. He meant it in respect. He's, he's showing that, that this is more than average. This is very, very important to me. And he stood up and then he bowed. And to show, hey, this is no small thing. You know what? Death is no small thing. Death is no bump in the road. Death is to be considered. So Abraham placed importance on it and said, listen, th this is of more detail than you realize. Let me tell you this morning, death is more detail than you realize. You, you know, uh, the two individuals that we see in the Gospel of Luke, uh, I think it's uh, chapter 11, and two people die in that chapter, uh, one a beggar named Lazarus and one that's just simply referred to as a rich man. And the Bible says both of both their deaths, they both died that night, that immediately, one of them was immediately in torments and the other one was immediately in Abraham's bosom. I don't think Abraham's bosom exists anymore, but what it meant is that there, there was life up beyond death and it was immediate. I don't believe in soul sleep. Uh, David's out here in the cemetery. Well, let me say this. His remains, just like Sarah's remains, his remains are out here. And I don't know David's soul situation, but he's either in glory, and as hard as this sounds, or he's in hell. One of the two. No in-betweens. Catholics came up with, a, uh, with the in-between. Hey, listen, dear friend, you go through that Bible and you'll never find the word purgatory even in the book. That's not a reality. It's one or the other. No in-betweens. And, and, and so we find then that Abraham stands up and then he bows because it was an important thing to him because he didn't want to be identified with the people of the land. He didn't want to be buried with the people of the land. Why? Because he was different. He didn't want to acclimate in any way to the people that were around him. <clears throat> Verse 7, And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead, out of my sight, again, that was his goal, hear me and entreat me to Ephraim, the son of Zohar. So he was going to go up the, the ladder, so to speak. He said, if you can't help me, send me to somebody that can. Verse 9, and give me the cave of Machpelah, which, is, which he have, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it's worth. He shall give it me for possession of a bearing place among you. And Ephraim dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham and the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went to the gate of the city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field that I give the field give I thee, and the cave that is in therein I give it thee, in the presence of the sons of my people. Give it, give I it thee, bury thy dead. Now, this seems like a solution. 
And you, you know what we want in 2020 is a smooth solution. We want it just to go just like a whipped cream over a pie, don't we? But see, and that's what the world will offer you. He the, the very president of the Hethites said, hey, I've got this cave over here. You're welcome to it. Nobody's ever used it. But this was the thing, and this is what Abraham would get to. It don't cost me anything that way. Remember when David got out of the will of the Lord, and he had those three days where he was running from the enemy, and the reason he got out of the will of the Lord is because he'd taken into Bathsheba. Y'all remember that? And as he was running and in the battle, finally the angel of the Lord said, it's enough. And at the place that he landed, there was a meal. Make cornmeal, wheat. And there was a threshing floor in it. And the owner said, yeah, because immediately when the judgment stopped, he wanted to give God glory. He said, I'll use this, I'll, I'll use this grist meal, and I'll break it down, I'll break the wheel down, and we'll burn her up for, for glory to God. And the owner says, hey, David, do the king, take it. He said, no, no, I won't buy it from you because it's got to cost me something. Yeah. See, sin's going to cost you. It'll cost you now or it'll cost you in eternity, but it will cost you something. Right. And, and, and so uh, David understood this and Abraham stood, understood the principle too. Now, verse 12, and Abraham the second bow, and Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land, verse 13, and he spake to Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, but if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham and said, my Lord hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. Why is, what is that betwixt me and thee? Bury before, excuse me, therefore, uh, bury therefore thy dead. Now, you don't think that's much of a, an amount. Uh, I did the calculation, or my computer did. That's 120,000 American dollars. Um, that's a lot of money to me. <laughs> It may not have been to Abraham, and it may not have been to Abraham's fellow there, you know. What's 120000 between me and you, Steve? Well, between me and Steve, that's a lot of money. Right? So, we learn a principle there. Death is going to cost you something. Death is, there's a price tag to death, and that's your never-ending soul. There's a price tag to death. Now, when you begin to talk about death, you know, in the modern age, you never hear about very few people talking about death and immediately jump into eternity, which is the important part. When people talk about death, man, uh, I don't want to die with cancer. And I've seen a lot of people go that way. And you know what? I'm going to be real honest. I don't want to go that way either. But if it's through the cancer way, What's really important is the other side, not how I get there. And Abraham knew this. He knew there was a price tag to death. And, and you better get that in your head too. There's a price tag to death. And that's your never ending, never dying soul. That is the price tag to death. Verse 16. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim and uh, Abraham weighed to Ephron the, several, the silver which he had named in the audience of the son of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. In other words, he had someone arbitrary come in and measure it out. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave that was therein, and all the trees that were in the field and the, that were all the borders around about were made sure, in other words, they surveyed it, unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth and before all that in the gate of the city. And after this, 
After all that turmoil, Abraham buried his wife. Now, I want you to see that death is going to cost you something too. I want you to see how meticulous, even to having someone arbitrary come in and weigh out the silver, how important death was to Abraham. Now, I want to ask you how important is death to you? Because, dear friend, it's coming. It is, and, and for some of us, you know what? It's coming before others. I don't know when I'll die. I may be the next one in this building to face judgment. But it's coming. And with death, there is a price. And I'm not talking, I, I hope y'all don't make God a pay for a grave out here by the, by the church building, but if that's what y'all want to do, I mean, it's your prerogative, it's your land. That's not what I am fearing. That's not my concern. See, the price of death is your sin. Yeah. And the only answer to that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Yeah. There's nothing else that will remedy it. There's nothing that will make the account balanced. It is the blood of Christ. Now, we live in a day and age where people equate the blood to water. That's not true. You know, you know what? Lost people that are baptized, they go down a dry lost person and they come up a wet lost person. Only difference, right? And, and I want to read one more verse, and I know all of you know it because it's one of my favorite verses and I'm having to find it without my usual help. Um, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Uh, in verse 14. Acts 16 and verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia. Now, I want you to see, if you want particular redemption, you look at Lydia and you look at what she was doing because she wasn't the only woman down there. The Bible says just a little bit before him, but before that, that, that Paul and his and his followers went down to the river, and behold, there were women there, and he talked unto them, the whole group. But a certain woman, a specific individual, an individual that was, was particular unto Christ, that Abraham didn't, I mean, excuse me, that Paul didn't know who she was, so he spoke to everybody. And the Bible says then, in verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia, a, a specific individual, a seller of purple, which means she sold the material that went into the Jewish religion's head covering for the men, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. Now, I want you to see that Lydia was a religious person. Didn't do her any good, but she worshiped God. And in your King James Bible, that's a capital G, meaning Jehovah God, Jehovah Jireh, the God of the Bible. She worshiped him, but she wasn't saved. And you know what would have happened to Lydia if she had died in that condition? She'd been held guilty. Think about the failed that um, that Abraham had 124,000 American dollars. If you want to look at it as a balance, Lydia, give me 124,000. See, she was guilty. She was religious. She even made the head coverings for the men. She 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 was sincere. You know what? A lot of very sincere people die and go to hell. She was sincere in what she was doing. She believed that she was serving God. She worshipped God according to the old Jewish law. She thought things were good. Which worship God heard us. Now what you will find essential to every redeemed person that ever been saved, you got to hear the gospel. Yeah. You got to hear the gospel. 
And you know why I keep preaching after 25 years? Sometimes for as many, as few as three or four people, it's because I'm trying to be faithful. Because you know what? The God's people are not branded. And just as the, he was preaching to a few women, hey, there's the opportunity to go for it. And so, she heard the gospel, and then the very essential thing at the end of verse 14, whose heart the Lord opened. See, what's the miraculous event in salvation is that God comes in and makes it real. That's why I'm not going, my little granddaughter will be six this week. Love her with all my heart. But I would be doing a very big injustice to her to come down and say, you say this little prayer with me, Gracie, and things is all going to be good. And you know why? Why I'd be doing Gracie an injustice? The Lord didn't open her heart. There's no sinner prayer in the King James Bible. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anywhere except in the mind of man. That heart has to be opened. And that's what many stand in need of today. Is their heart just opened. And, and listen, when it's open, it's open. And you'll attend unto the things that, that God has spoken. Verse 15. And when she was baptized, now Baptists don't like this today, and uh, Church of Christ thrive on it, but you find the conversion of every person in the Bible, and they were immediately baptized. Now, that didn't give them any kind of one-up on God, and it didn't make their salvation more solid, but it did tell the world this, hey, I've been saved, I've been born again. Yeah, that's right. And so... It wasn't the salvation, it wasn't the baptism that saved Lydia, because see that came after That's right. her heart was opened. Came afterwards. So, dear friend, this morning, what about you? Where do you stand? Because see, payment's coming. The bill. You know what? Really, if you lost this morning, the bill's overdue. You know, uh, the other day, uh, I got the mail. My, my mother always puts the mail at the church right here, and, and I review it. And our water bill was past due. Don't don't cut us don't cut us off, Steve. And uh, <laughs> the reason why is the payment and the bill passed in the mail. And uh, but it was overdue. When you get the red one from the light company and the and the water company, it's past due. And they have every right to cut her off. See what I'm saying? Those of you that are lost within me, within my presence this morning, it's past due. Yeah. You owe the bill and then some. So are you saved or are you lost? See, that's the only question of this life that really matters. That's right. The woman, Sarah, lived 127 years. And the only thing that really mattered was she saved. Yeah. I don't know about I don't know about Sarah's situation. I think I think she loved the Lord. You can find the limits in her life where there was some indication that she loved the Lord. But I also know she laughed in his face. And that's pretty serious. I don't know if a safe person would do that or not. But you know what? I don't have to worry about Sarah. I have to worry about Larry. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I pray every one of them will be saved. But when it comes down, I'm accountable for my own sins and no one else's. Yeah. So what I need to, instead of worrying about, you know, now I've seen theologians, was Sarah saved? And, uh, uh, was David really saved and was uh, Solomon a ruler you know what that's stupid it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter what I have to be concerned with is am I saved not a member of a Baptist church am I saved 
Do I know the Lord Jesus Christ personally? Am I like me? Did he open my heart one day to the fact that I was hopeless and helpless? And did I cry out to him? And I don't mean, you know, Lord help me. There's nothing wrong with Lord help me, Lord save me. I don't have an issue with that. But notice our text. Lydia said nothing. Yeah. Lord just opened her heart and saved her soul. I, that's the kind of salvation I want to take out here. Not something I said or something I don't. What about you? Yeah. Uh, 